This week, uh, I want to turn to a parable. Now, I am currently teaching a class on the parables of Jesus, and uh, w- one of our recent parables, our class essentially dared me to preach it uh, because it's sort of a strange and confusing parable. They dared me to preach it. I took the dare. I actually did it Sunday in this building um, where I think like three of you all were present because everybody else is on spring break. Uh, so for the three of you who are all behind me right now, sorry, rerun. Right? Uh, my sermons are already in syndication. But the, uh, this parable fits our topic of faith matters as well. Uh, it is the parable of the wedding banquet, and it is found in Matthew chapter 22. Now, if you've got a Bible and you want to flip over there, go to Matthew 22. I'll be there in a minute. First, let me tell you that this is a parable that occurs in two Gospels. Matthew tells the story, so does Luke. Okay? Now, it's different in those two Gospels. I'll bet you're familiar with the version found in Luke. You know the story? There's a a guy who throws a wedding for his son, and there's going to be a banquet to celebrate the wedding, you know, what you would call a reception, but it's a much bigger thing for them. It's going to be a reception, and the master sends out what amount to, you know, save the date cards, right? Hey, the wedding's going on, and then when it's time to actually do the wedding, the man sends out servants that say, hey, the wedding is going on, time for everybody to show up, and nobody shows up. Remember the story? Nobody comes to the wedding. Instead, everybody's got an excuse, and they're all good excuses. One guy says, ah, I just bought a field. I need to go check it out. Another guy says, well, I just got married myself. It's honeymoon time. I'm not going to your wedding right now. He doesn't go. Right, nobody shows up. So you got this wedding, and nobody comes. And so you remember what happens, right? The, uh, the, 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 the father throwing the wedding sends out his servants and says, fine, if those guests aren't going to show up, then just go get whoever you can find. Someone's going to eat this food. All right? had a cousin who got married one time. This actually happened uh, to her. Um, They they got there. She was supposed to get married. She ended up not getting married because something happened where one of the the members of the wedding party no-showed the wedding. It was a real traumatic experience. But there's all this food down in the fellowship hall. Somebody's going to eat that food. Right? And so, aside from the trauma of the bridal party trying to figure out what they're going to do now that there's not a wedding going on, the parents were scrambling around calling everybody they knew. Come carry off this food. You've got to come bring a, bring a Tupperware dish. Come take this food, right? Somebody's got to eat the food. This father does the same thing, right? Somebody's got to eat this banquet. Go find anybody you can. And I remember the King James of this. Go into the highways and the hedges. Anybody learned that phrase? I learned that phrase. Um, and, and what I was told that that phrase meant was, go find them wherever you can find them. I don't care if they're homeless, stinky, doesn't matter, bring them in, right? And, and in Luke, the emphasis on this parable falls in two places. One, the excuse makers. And two, the final guest lists. That it's not the people that you expected to show up to the party, but it's all sorts of other people, all sorts of riffraff, not exactly a who's who list. And, and the point of that parable is that the kingdom of God might just end up including some people that you didn't expect. Now, that's what Luke does with the parable. I want you to compare that with Matthew's version, which is no doubt the less familiar version. You will hear that in Matthew, it's pretty similar, but uh, there, there's some pretty remarkable differences. Now, if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's a real debate among New Testament scholars about whether or not these are even the same parable, right? Some scholars say, nope, these are just two wildly different parables that just happen to share the same imagery of a wedding banquet. Others say, no, it's it's the same parable, but either Jesus or the gospel writers have the creativity to use a story in different ways. You can do the same thing, right? You know how to do that. You know how to tell a story, and depending on what audience you're talking to or what points you want to make in the story, you can shade the details and make different points, right? You just came back from spring break. You, you, made, you made it home, maybe you got one quick dinner on Sunday afternoon. Mama says, baby, how was the beach? And you're going to answer that question, right? But you're probably not going to answer that question with the same stories and the same details as when you got back here and you walked back into the 
to, to, to Heritage Hall, and, and your buddy in the hall says, how's it right. And it's not that you lied in either case, but you have this instinct about which details you might ought to tell at one point or not. Right? I mean, certainly that doesn't apply to anybody in here. But, but you know how to take a story and shape it, right? Now, I consider myself a pretty decent storyteller, but my goodness, there's no way that, uh, that I'm a better storyteller than Jesus, right? I mean, that guy's got some stories. So if you and I have the sense to take a story and shade its meaning based on the audience we're talking to or the point we intend to make, surely Jesus does, right? I cannot believe for a second that if you're Jesus and you have this whole pocket full of incredible stories to tell that we call parables, why in the world you would only tell them once? I mean, if you've got the parable of the Good Samaritan in your back pocket, you're going to use that more than once, right? I think you've got the same thing here. I think this is the same parable, but Jesus has used different details to make some different points. Hear Matthew's version of this parable, Matthew chapter 22. So once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of the heavens can be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, everything is ready, come to the banquet. But they made fun of it and they went away, one of them to his farm, another to his business. But the rest of them seized his slaves, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Matthew's version is decidedly more violent, yes? (laughs) He's burning the towns down. So he said to his slaves, the wedding's ready. But, now by the way, apparently he burned down the city in between the time that the wedding food was ready and the time somebody actually eats it. That's a pretty quick scorched earth policy. Go into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. And so those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. And the story does not stop there. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? The man was speechless So the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. You see why there's a debate about whether or not that's even the same parable, right? So here we've got what seems like the same story. A wedding is going on. The people that are invited don't show up. Instead, somebody else shows up. It's a different guest list. But you've got this extra detail of a guy who shows up not dressed right, and he ends up getting ejected and thrown out onto his ear, okay? And not just ejected, but he gets, I mean, this is a pretty painful ejection. Outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Like, this is, for Matthew, kind of Matthew's judgment language, synonymous with he got thrown into hell. Uh, That's a pretty rough penalty for just, you know, not wearing your tuxedo. What happens if y'all don't wear your tuxedo in the morning? Dr. Thorson will spank you later, but you, you're not going to sing. Right? You just have to sit over here in detention, I guess. It's probably not a lot worse than that. It probably is a lot worse than that, isn't it? <laughs> they just show up in their wedding robe, and they got thrown into outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Really? Now, for Matthew, this parable is used completely differently. In Luke... The story occurs kind of in the middle of Jesus' life, in the middle of his teachings, surrounded by a lot of other teachings about insider, outsider, inclusion, exclusion. For Matthew, this story occurs in the final days of Jesus' life, when his death is imminent, surrounded by a lot of other stories about final judgments. The context already has this sort of final judgment air to it. Uh, So does this image of weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness. More than that, if you're a good reader of the Old Testament, as of course you all are, Dr. Garner's in the back, so if you're not, don't say anything. You should recognize from the Old Testament that the image of a wedding banquet is a standard image for 
the end. Whatever the end is, the Old Testament frequently uses this image of a wedding banquet to talk about it. It is an eschatological image. You know that word? Eschatological. It's going to show up on a religion test someday. Eschatology is what you believe about the end. Okay? Whatever you believe about the end, that's your eschatology. So if you think uh, the angels are going to blow a trumpet and everybody's going to fly up in the air except for these other suckers who get left behind, right? That's your eschatology. Um, if, you, uh, if you think we're just going to gradually move on until we annihilate each other with nuclear weapons or an asteroid hits us, right? That's your eschatology. You've got an eschatology. You've got something you think about the end. Okay? This is an eschatological image. The image of a wedding feast or a wedding banquet is an image for God coming in and rescuing God's people in the end. And, notably, it's a party. You could have used the image of a funeral. But it's an image of a wedding banquet. It's a party. What is the kingdom of God like? Well, it's at least that. It's supposed to be a party, a feast, a banquet. And strangely, the people that thought they were invited and should be there don't show up. So there's something in this parable about who's going to be in that final kingdom. And it may not be the people that just sort of assume they get to go. The guest list might be different. But in this parable, there's one more wrinkle that really matters. And it's this final scene. You see, when it comes to reading parables, there's this rule of end stress. That is, whatever happens at the end of a story is most likely the most important part. And for Jesus' stories, that's usually where there's some sort of twist. And the final scene here involves a guy who shows up not wearing a wedding robe. And whatever else that means, it is a significant enough offense that he gets ejected from the party. And again, the implication is, you could actually be into the party and still get ejected. Now that'll be fun, trying to figure out what that means about the kingdom of God. So the wedding robe. The guy who's not wearing a wedding robe. What in the world would that detail mean? Now, unless somebody tells you this, you're probably never going to notice it on your own. I had to, I had to be told. But I'm going to tell you, so now you will know. The image of clothing in the New Testament is a pretty standard image for discipleship. Being clothed is an image, a metaphor, for what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. You hear it in Paul when Paul says, be clothed in Christ, or be clothed in righteousness. Or when Paul says, put on Christ. There's the, this image of being clothed as a disciple. Uh, the most full-blown version of that in Paul comes at the end of Ephesians, with the armor of God passage, you know that one, right? Where every piece of the suit of armor stands for something. There's a helmet of salvation, a chest piece of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, Every piece of the armor stands for something. It's a full-blown version of this metaphor, but clothing as what it means to be a disciple. You might recall a couple of other examples that maybe you've not connected with this image before. Um, the ends of the Gospels. Two of them in particular. John. You get to the end of John, and there's this scene where the disciples, though they have seen Jesus already, they know He's raised... That might be good news for everybody else, but it's bad news for them. They just abandoned him, denied him, ran away. So even if Jesus is raised and this is good news, it's not good news for them. And so they just go back to their old life. They go back to fishing. So it's this painful scene of the disciples out on the water doing what they used to do back before Jesus found them. And there are two in particular in the boat. The beloved disciple and Peter. And then a scene unfolds with a stranger on the shore who yells out, Y'all catch anything yet? No. Throw your net over the other side. You're supposed to recognize that scene, right? Do you? It's the scene of when they were first called. And so they throw their net over the side of the boat. They pull in so many fish they can't haul them in. And aha, the light bulb comes on. It's the Lord says the beloved disciple. And then this really curious detail. It says, and Peter, who was fishing naked, put on his clothes, jumped in the water, and swam to the shore. And you might ask, students in my class, I said this semester, why in the world is this man fishing naked? 
No one fishes naked. Not in that culture, not in this culture. Why is Peter fishing naked and in the boat with another dude? That's a weird story. <laughs> Beloved disciples should be uncomfortable with that, right? But if you know the metaphor of clothing, this story makes sense, right? Peter is naked. He's a denier of Jesus the last time you saw him. He's not an insider anymore. But here's Christ recalling him on the shore, reclothing him. Or the end of the Gospel of Mark. It's in chapter 14, verse 51. You've got a unique detail that only occurs in Mark. At the arrest of Jesus, uh, everybody scatters to the hillsides, right? You know about that? All the disciples bolt. They all scatter. And there's one guy whom the guards grab his clothes. And he's so determined to get away from Jesus that he runs right out of his clothes to get away. And he runs off into the night naked. Call him the little runaway naked boy. Only occurs in Mark. Now, most of you in your Bible, if you've got little study notes at the bottom right, you flip down there and the study notes will say, some scholars believe this is Mark himself, the author of the gospel, putting himself into the story. Like his way of saying, see, I know this is true, I was there. All right? There's absolutely no reason to think that. I've got a better idea. The word that's used to describe this guy, uh, the Greek word just means young man. It's a very generic term. It just means young man. It's very common in the Greek language, but it's odd that it only occurs twice in the whole New Testament. Once is there. The other is in the Gospel of Mark at the resurrection. Some of you have noticed this weird vexing detail in the Gospels that uh, as you read across the four Gospels, there's no agreement about who is at the tomb to meet the women when they come on Easter Sunday morning. You've got one man in Mark. Matthew's got two men. Luke has, or one angel. Luke has two men. John has two angels. So one man, one angel, two men, two angels. You've got all four of those represented in the gospel. Mark has one young man. It's the same Greek word. And the implication, at least, is that this is probably the same young man who ran off earlier. And he's described in the final chapter of Mark as a young man dressed in white standing beside the tomb. If you know that metaphor of discipleship, you can see this at work here, right? He ran away. He left Jesus. He's not an insider anymore. Not a disciple. He left. But he has been reclothed now an insider again, recalled, and set up as the only witness to the resurrection in Mark. This metaphor of discipleship, um, or as, as clothing for discipleship, occurs more than you would think in the New Testament. I would suggest to you that in this parable, here's another example. There's a wedding banquet. Everyone is supposed to know that that's an image of the final judgment. What it's going to be like in the end when God rescues God's people. Yet there is somebody here at this banquet who is not dressed correctly. He didn't wear the wedding robe. And because of that, he gets thrown out of the party. So, what does that parable mean? Let me suggest this. This parable is teaching us that discipleship, being dressed in Christ, that discipleship is a necessary part of salvation. And that failure to be a disciple, failure to be clothed in Christ, risks putting you on the wrong side of the judgment in the end. Let me say that another way. I think one of the deficiencies that we have in our Christian faith is we've made this binary distinction between salvation on the one hand and discipleship on the other. And it's kind of a product of the Reformation. Uh, Luther and the other reformers talked about salvation or justification. And they also talked about sanctification as if it were a totally different thing. And the way that I don't know, at least the churches that I was around growing up, the way we dealt with this is we talked about salvation. That was the important thing. You need to walk a church aisle, you need to do the thing, you need to get baptized, right? Ask Jesus into your heart. And if you never do anything else, that's enough. 
And there's a sense in which that is true. And then we treat sanctification, discipleship, what you need to do as a follower of Jesus, like it's a totally separate thing. And, and the subtext of all of the churches I tended to be in was that this is really optional. We think you ought to do it. It'd be a good idea. It's important. But if you don't, it's okay because you did the other. Jesus makes no such distinction between salvation and sanctification or getting saved and being a disciple. They are one in the same. we got to have a bigger picture of salvation. That it is simply not okay that we just say a magic prayer and leave it and forget it. But that you are called to something bigger, deeper, something more. That is also a part of what it means to be saved. In fact, in the New Testament, if we were to translate it more accurately to the way that the language sort of reads, we wouldn't use the, the term, I was saved. That sounds like a past tense verb that you could pinpoint on a map, right? The New Testament tends to use this language of being saved, as if it's an ongoing, progressive process. You are saved and continually being saved. We like to separate that. We were saved and we continue to grow in Christ. But for Jesus, this is all one thing. They're not separate ideas. And in this parable, that's really important. Because apparently it's possible that you could actually get an invite and get inside the doors of the wedding party. But if not dressed correctly, you can still find yourself on the outside. Your discipleship matters. Not just the things you believe in your head, but also the things you do with your hands and your feet and your mouth. All of that is part of salvation. They're not either or. And Jesus underscores this clearly in this parable. One thing I hope that you hear in the coming weeks in chapel is that faith is not just an exercise in your head or in your heart, but it is also an exercise that must bleed out into your practice necessarily. As Matthew puts it, you must be dressed correctly. If I have an enemy in the Christian faith, this is it. It's that we keep selling a gospel that I call, all you got to do is just. You should always be leery of that phrase, right? Anytime somebody calls, I, mean, I don't know, do you still get telemarketer calls? My parents, they still got that landline at the house. They still get telemarketers calling. I've never had telemarketers call my cell phone. But if you, uh, if you get telemarketers and you're foolish enough to answer the phone, right, on the other end, someone will say, all you got to do is just sign up. Da, 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 da. No, that's not all you got to do is just. It's going to cost me something. You wouldn't be making this call if you didn't stand to make money and I stand to lose it. Right? All you got to do is just is a bad phrase. Cable company. All you got to do is just upgrade to that gold package. Your teacher told you, all you got to do is just study. And then it turns out it didn't work out all that well. Right. All you got to do is just is a bad phrase. It's never really true. It's always more. Why do we do it in religious circles? Why do we sell a gospel of all you got to do is just? And we finish the phrase in a lot of ways, right? All you got to do is just walk a church aisle. All you got to do is just pray a magic prayer. All you got to do is just believe in your heart, right? For Jesus, this idea of believing, of faith, always implies action. There's no all you got to do is just gospel. A gospel that costs Christ everything doesn't come to you for cheap. A free gift indeed, but a, but a gift that comes with all sorts of demand with it. The demand of being a follower, of being a disciple. You're invited to the wedding. And Jesus hopes you'll go. But you can't just show up. You've got to show up dressed right. Your discipleship matters to what Jesus means by salvation. 
as we go through this coming month, may you hear these implications of what it means to be follower of Christ. May you remember in this season of Lent, as we approach the cross and Easter, that a cross that Jesus dies on is also a call to pick up a cross of my own and come die too. That is not cheap. That is not without demands. To be a follower, to be a disciple, is going to require some things of us. May we take that seriously also. Will you pray with me? Oh Christ, we recognize this morning that we have a tendency to seek out the easiest possible path. We like the allure of a gospel that says all you got to do is just. But may we hear clearly from your teachings that you never sold that kind of gospel. You talked about a gospel that demanded we pick up a cross and follow. You talked about a gospel that says if we want to save our life, we must lose it. Help us to realize this morning that it might not just be good enough that we got invited to the party, but that we need to show up dressed correctly when we get there. Help us learn what it means to be clothed in you, to be dressed as disciples, and help us to take that part of our salvation seriously also. We pray these things this morning in the name of the one who carried a cross and called us to do the same, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.